that, we are very excited to have our panel moderator, Dr. Salem McGarian. And I'm going to introduce him right now. Dr. McGarian came to Santa Cruz as the Pediatric Medical Director at Dominican Hospital in 1993. He has been active both clinically in building healthcare programs for children in Santa Cruz since that time. Dr. McGarren graduated from Harvard Medical School and completed his pediatric residency at the University of Utah. Prior to coming to Santa Cruz, he was on the faculty of the University of Utah and served as the medical director for the infant toddler unit at the Primary Children's Medical Center in Salt Lake City. During his time at Dominican, Dr. McGarren led the development of a level three NICU, started the Dominican Pediatric Clinic, which provided access to care for low-income children and those with special health care needs, and served as a fi first five board commis commissioner. The Dominican Clinic now exists as the pediatric department of the East Cliff Community Health Center, a busy and successful federally qualified health clinic in Live Oak. He led the effort to establish a multidisciplinary evaluation clinic for all children under five entering the foster care system. This was a collaboration between Dominican Hospital, Stanford Children's Hospital, Santa Cruz County Children's Mental Health, Santa Cruz Child Protective Services, and First Five Santa Cruz. In 2019, Dr. McGarren was given the Healthcare Innovator Award by the Santa Cruz Health Improvement Partnership. This award recognized his ongoing work with substance abusing mothers and their infants. He still sees patients in Live Oak and is involved in an effort to, to develop a community-based integrated program for substance using mothers and their infants. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McGarrian and thank you for all your amazing contribution to our community. Well, thank you, Karen, for all those very kind words and it is an honor to be on this stage for the Calciono Symposium, and it is a total honor. And for the Dominican Hospital Foundation, I personally am very grateful because they supported many programs that I was involved with at Dominican, particularly being a founding uh, foundation for starting the Dominican Pediatric Clinic. So thank you, Dominican Hospital Foundation, as well. So um, I do have one piece of good news, and that is I'm not going to sing. Because I was thinking about it, because uh, in tribute to Dr. Twenge this morning, she was talking about the intergenerational connection, and I thought for you boomers out there, you might be able to relate to sort of our theme musical, Hair. You remember Hair, and you remember <laughs> this is the age, the dawning of the age of anxiety? That's what, <laughs> that's what it seemed, but I, I didn't. So the other thing is we're all missing Freddie here, because you know Freddie Weinstein has done a fabulous job of sharing this, and somehow I'm here today doing this. So we miss Freddie, but I did come in as a runner-up for the Freddie Weinstein Lookalike Contest at Dominican <laughs> Hospital. So that, that's what we have. So we have three new members uh, of our panels, and I'm going to ask them to introduce them themselves. There's Elizabeth, there's Erica, and there's Cassie. And Cassie is sitting closest, so Cassie, would you like to introduce sure. yourself? Um, okay, can you guys hear me? Um, I'm Cassie Barlow. I will be the newest member of the Calciano family in August. I'm marrying Nick. Um, the reason I'm up here is because I am your real life proof of anxiety. Um, I've had anxiety since middle school. Um, I'm going to start with something that works for me. If I at any time during this feel like I need to step out, I will. And by just me saying that, I'm probably going to feel fine and not going to need to step out. Um, but so I've had anxiety since I was around 12 years old. I've suffered with it in a bunch of different ways to the point where it's been so bad that I couldn't go to my classes. I was calling my mom every day in middle school and saying, please come pick me up. Please come pick me up. I can't do this. I can't. Finally, it got to the point where I was able to make deals with my teachers and the counselors where if I needed to, just like I just said, leave the room and I was allowed because they have bathroom passes and things like that back then. Um, and that started to work for me. Then I started to get actual panic disorder, and that was kind of a newer thing for me. So I actually feel the full, full body panic attacks. And I know if you've never had a panic attack before, it's the feeling of sweaty hands, um, my vision goes blurry, I can't um, really see too much anymore, like the room starts a little bit spinning, um, very elevated heart rate. 
basically it makes it really hard to do anything that you ever want to do if you're in the middle of a panic attack. Um, so I've kind of been able to manage my anxiety from that point of middle school on. I now work in a very um, great corporate culture company. I'm able to sit through meetings. I've uh, been promoted three times since I've been there. So I am the living proof that you can start on a really low place of anxiety and feel like you can never go anywhere with it. And I'm living a very full functioning life with high level anxiety, so. Elizabeth. So I'm Elizabeth Howard Gibbon. I'm a detective with the Santa Cruz Police Department. I've been there about six years. Um, prior to that, I was a student nearby at UC Santa Cruz, and I worked for the United States Geological Survey over off of uh, a Mission Street Extension. So I've been in this area for a while. Um, uh, day to day, I deal with uh, youth and anxiety in a variety of ways. We have the Youth Violence Prevention Task Force, where law enforcement uh, recently they had um, a like discussion group that I participated in last year, where they got where youth and community members uh, got to have dialogues with law enforcement and talk about perceptions and the best way for law enforcement to communicate with members of the community and address their needs. Um, we also do a Citizens Academy, a Citizen Police Academy, and a Teen Academy, where it creates kind of a space for community members and youth to have a safe place uh, to, to basically learn about law enforcement, why we do the things that we do, our methods, and also create a place where we can also communicate without fear of enforcement. Um, we also have a bunch of mental health uh, changes in law enforcement that we're trying to foster through, um, we have two mental health liaisons that are, uh, yeah, I love them too. <laughs> Woo! They're uh, members of Santa Cruz, they're actually employees of Santa Cruz County. They're not employees of the Santa Cruz Police Department. And they assist us on ride-alongs to help us um, find the best way to communicate with someone who might be in a moment of crisis. So uh, we're I'm learning a lot just by being here today. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot just being up here on the panel, but um, I hope to bring a unique perspective. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Wonderful. Erica? Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Padilla Chavez, and I'm the CEO of Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, or PVPSA. Um, it's an honor and a privilege for, for me to be, be up here in this amazing panel with all of you. Uh, what an honor to be here in the presence of what I, I believe are all of the angels in our community who are doing that secret work. Um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about PVPSA and what we do. So for over 30 years, um, PVPSA has offered social emotional supports to the largest school district in Santa Cruz County. That would be Paro Valley Unified School District. We do that by placing mental health and substance abuse uh, counselors and case managers at the various schools of the district. Um, we are very family focused and family centered because we recognize that um, in order to address the needs of uh, the children and the youth we serve, it requires a perspective of the family dynamic and family involvement. I'm very proud of that because that's an initiative that I, uh, my five years at PBPSA, um, uh, brought to, to the organization from my prior observations as an administrator in the Monterey County mental health system. Um, I, I, there's emerging needs that are happening right now in our, uh, many of the families we serve. I'm very proud to say that PVPSA strives really hard to be responsive to those emerging needs, things like anxiety related to immigration fears uh, that are very relevant and present right now in our community and in the households we, we provide support to um, as an example. I look forward to um, sharing uh, my knowledge and my observations, but also learning. I, I consider myself a student first, and I'm very, very happy to be here this afternoon. Wow, what an incredible panel. Let's get right down to it. And our, this is not meant to be question and answer alone. It's question, discussion, and we'll let different people have a, a go at it. But this is sort of going for the holy grail right at the very beginning. How are we managing the issue of reality versus fantasy, truth versus lies, information versus misinformation? Paul's listed on this. Would you have a first go at this, Paul? God, okay. <laughs> 
All right, that's not an easy one. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me about ice cream or something. <laughs> um, I, I do think, I mean, with, with technology, particularly with young people, the line between reality and fantasy, it gets blurred. Um, as I indicated in my talk, many of my students and the young people I work with have very, very unrealistic fantasies about the work world, for example, um, and professions that they might possibly go into. Um, they fantasize about those things because of film, because of television, um, and uh, using media to inform themselves rather than getting out there and talking to people and engaging people in professions. Um, I'm also on a kick right now with the people that I, the, the young people I work with about the fact that there are wonderful careers out there where you actually work with your hands and do things uh, and build things and create things. Um, so I think we need to interject both in our educational systems and our schools more opportunities for that to happen, um, create more connections for young people to, to real life people, those of us who will take the time to invite young people into our offices, share what we do, come to things like this, go to schools and talk about our activities and what not. So I don't know if that answers no. the question. And would other people like to comment on that question as well in terms of the information, truth versus fantasy? Yeah, I, I'll weigh in on that. Uh, there, there's a lot of information out there and of dubious quality. And so I, ideally we want to be skeptical consumers and, and scientific consumers and maybe we need to train our our children to to be the same and and not accept at at face value everything that they're seeing or reading on the internet, um, but I think a, a compounding problem with that is is the issue of uh, of cognitive bias and that we all suffer from and and we we all tend to look at those things that support the beliefs we already have and to ignore those things that don't and uh, so maybe pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit and, and uh, looking at, at both sides of situations would be a way that we could ensure the accuracy of the information that we're getting. Right. I'd like to make one further comment. I think in my work as a pediat pediatrician, this comes at the forefront in the anti-vax movement. And I think that the internet has been the main driving force. It's not the information, it's not the papers, it, it is really having false news be on equal footing of, of scientific studies. And it has the inability to really tell the difference between a generally world-class refereed opinion and opinion. For instance, if you do a search on vaccine safety, you'll see about six or seven links to alternative ideas before you see the CDC in the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd question. I'm gonna ask one more pediatric question and I think I wanna ask it to you, Gary. Uh, and this was, in, and for those of us who see children on a daily basis, many people in schools, some of us in offices, what are some very, very brief things that we might want to do if we want to do some type of innovation, maybe it's motivational interviewing for helping people control their use of cell phones and um, social media? Brief interventions. Well, thanks. Uh, I tried to touch on a, a couple of ideas at, at the end of my presentation along those lines. Uh, just. I would say if, if you have a, just a brief period of time with some, maybe you're having an office visit with a, with, with a child, talk to the parent, present the idea of, of just little breaks. Let's take a uh, you know, 15-minute break here and there. Or uh, I love the idea of, um, uh, I think it was Gene, I can't remember if it was Gene or you, Paul, who was talking about the, the family dinner uh, you know, and, and how that how that in many cases has gone by the wayside. Uh, I think a lot of the work would be done with the parent, though. And 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 what are what are we modeling, right? If we if we tell our children, you know, you need to do something other than be on your phone, but that's all we're doing. Uh, you know, what what message are we giving? So if we can carve out some time for. Uh, uh, let's say a family dinner and make it a, uh, a phone free, a television free time to, to talk and be with each other, I think that will go a long way. Good, and I think Valerie wants to add something. Yeah, I think um, several of the presenters today and I discussed uh, Common Sense Media, which is a great organization. They have 
um, a plethora of resources for families and for schools. And they actually have a family tech agreement. So it's a contract that parents can review with their students, make with their students. At home, they're called kids, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but they can make an agreement, and it's a family con contract. It says things like, at 8.30, we will all plug in our phones downstairs. We will have family dinners without tech, things like that. So common use media is a great, uh, common sense media is a great resource. Um, the curriculum that they have is a digital citizenship curriculum, and it, it parts out all of those things that we want kids to know about being online and using their media responsibly. I mean, we give young kids a very, very powerful computer to hold in their pocket, and we just give it to them, and we wouldn't do the same thing with a driver's license, say. We wouldn't just hand a kid a Lamborghini, but in a sense, that's what we're doing by giving kids a smartphone with no lead up or training or um, uh, you know, guidelines on how to use such a powerful tool. So I recommend that. Right. So Valerie, there are several questions in a row that are, I think have most of your name on it, but let me just start with one. What is the best way to implement a no cell phone policy K through 12? And <laughs> do you know schools that have successfully done this? <laughs> um, here's, here's what I know. Uh, having spent most of my life in middle school, I know that it's a lot easier in elementary and middle school than it is in high school because in, at the high school level it becomes an incredibly challenging supervision issue and management issue that I don't know if high schools are able to do that unless they have a system where they physically confiscate phones on the way in the door. And I know that there are some schools that are um, in the Bay Area, actually fairly locally, that are uh, piloting programs where they have the kids put their phones in a certain envelope, they check them in, um, and they don't have them. At my school, we actually have implemented a no phones during the day, bell to bell system. Phones have to be off and in lockers from the beginning bell to the end bell. And what that took is a lot of conversation with our school staff to make everyone accountable. So um, all teachers are accountable for, if students have their phones out, for giving them a warning, uh, confiscating the phone, and there's a progression there. But since it's now an anomaly, it really is obvious if a kid is using their phone. It's very obvious as if a kid is looking down in <laughs> class. Um, but it takes everybody being vigilant, and now that it's a school norm, which meant we have a lot of buy-in, it's, it's really workable. And they don't have them out during brunch, they don't have them out during lunch. Um, I know that in the high school it's a lot more challenging. Also, teachers. If we, it's really hard for us to say, well, we can't have you do this, but I'm going to go over here and check my texts. So that's, that's been hard, but we've been doing it. Other commentary on that uh, question of cell phones in schools? Yes, Paul. Yeah, if I can just add one thing. I think we also need to get parental buy-in for these things. I mean, the number of times I've heard from parents that their child has to have a phone in case of an emergency. And I don't know what you guys did when you had an emergency at school, but I mean, none of us had cell phones at the time, and if our parents had to reach us, they called the school, and someone came to get us. So convincing parents that they need, that there's a good reason for their children not to have these devices in the classroom, that it interferes with learning, social development, and, and whatnot. So I think there's that aspect as well, the schools and working in conjunction with parents. Okay, Elizabeth? So in law enforcement, we also do a lot of education about cell phones because there are uh, a lot of parents that don't actually know what their child is capable of using a cell phone because not everyone grew up with a cell phone. Heck, I didn't even have a cell phone until I got out of high school, which is pretty rare nowadays. Um, but it's 
one of those things where we try to do presentations for both youth and adults on like what is possible with a cell phone, like who you can communicate with, um, what apps uh, can do. I mean, what could your child be using a phone for? Um, what kind of crimes are all done through this type of thing or platforms of social media? And this kind of opens a lot of people's eyes on, hey, you know, I pay for the device. I bought the device. The device is mine until I give it to my child. And there's a lot of laws now that protect children from having law enforcement getting into their phones, even if they have parents' permission because of privacy. So we always encourage parents, like, if you're going to give this sort of device uh, to a minor, make sure that you understand what you're giving them access to um, and how that could affect their life and how they think about themselves, how they think about others, and how they treat each other. Great. Other commentary? Yeah. Erica. You know, um, Somebody's going to have to help me with this, but what's, what I'm reminded about at PVUSD is something that occurred last year, or maybe a couple years ago. There was, I think, some Netflix show, um, and it was really arousing some suicidal... 13 Reasons Why. 13 it? Reasons. That's it, the 13 yeah. Reasons Why. And at PVUSD, obviously, we have um, uh, a lot of parents that are monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, and the school, obviously, through its alert system... Um, connected to the Chromebooks that they issue the students. Uh, they, they were getting all these flagging that had to do with this particular show, and there was a request by the superintendent to um, help her develop a letter uh, to the parents, and then, of course, uh, some education around appropriate use of cell phones, and we did this in Spanish. And it was a very interesting um, feedback that I, I received from some of our staff who participated in that workshop, particularly around just like the stare of the parents like wait the phone does what and it does what and it and it just made us realize that uh assume, assuming that all the parents know even the basics of a phone right uh not a good thing to go into a workshop because we just made assumptions about oh the parents know that this app exists and this app exists. so we literally had to do like cell phone 101 education in order for us to get to the core of the subject. Um, and I just wanted to share that because I think uh, many of our schools obviously uh, have a diversity of families and uh, just being mindful that not all parents uh, enter the conversation um, in the same starting point. Erica, I want, oh, Cassie has a yeah, comment. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add, I would just caution us to completely write off cell phones as being a complete negative, just because I know from an anxiety standpoint, there are a lot of positives. So I do think if we're educating, like you're saying, people on all the negatives of it, I think we should take a little bit of time to focus on the positive apps. Like I know there's an app called Calm that I use for nighttime meditation. Free for teachers. It's, I use yeah, it. it's great. It's great. So things like that. So there are best practices where if a kid's going to have their phone in their hand for six hours a day, make an hour of that be some sort of application that'll dive into their need to hold the phone, but have it be a meditation app. Have it be on YouTube. There are all kinds of videos for like relaxing yourself. I know when my anxiety is at a high, my fiance can attest to this, all night he has to listen to someone say, breathe through your body and through <laughs> your toes. Breathe in, breathe yeah. out. But the phone does have certain things like that. So I think if we could try to replace some of those, it might and a little bit more understanding with the kids instead of us saying, we're ripping this away from you and there's nothing good on it that you are ever going to find on it. Because there are some good things. It sounds like your commentary is trying to help us find that Goldilocks spot. But exactly. where, 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 <laughs> yes. Can you say a little bit more about what you think would be the best way for someone to be using a cell phone? I think the best way to use your cell phone... It's hard because I certainly use my cell phone in the ways that are not as great as well. Like I know with Instagram, for people my age in college, it was so much people posting all the time, like I'm having the best time, I'm, everything's great, there's never been a bad day in, that I've ever had. It's just not true. If you look at my Instagram when I was in college, you would have thought I had not an issue, not a single issue. Meanwhile, there were times where I literally couldn't even leave my dorm and I had to have my groceries delivered to me because my anxiety was so bad. So I think just knowing it's not real, making sure that people know that all of that kind of stuff is not real, but also 
finding and learning and creating sort of a need for these apps like the Calm app, like those YouTube meditations, I'm sure there's a million other ones, like My Fitness Pal, all those kind of things are positive apps. If we use them more, Apple and all these industries have, they assess the market need. If the market need right now is all Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, they're going to just keep building those. But if we start using the Calm apps, the meditation things, the anything else that we feel like has a positive aspect, they'll build more of it. So I think it's that. It's educating ourselves on what the positive pieces can be as well. Terrific. Just, just one thing to add. You know, I was struck by the slide that um, showed Steve Jobs in 2012, uh, 2007 introducing the first iPhone, and that's 12 years ago. And just how quickly this whole thing has exploded. And so what I'm taking... From, from all of these comments is that this, this happened so fast and now we have to catch up as a society and figure out, okay, what, how are we gonna deal with this and what does this all mean and how can we make this work for us? Uh, problem is it's gonna keep exploding even faster, so how do, how do we keep up? But I, I think that's our challenge. Okay, I'm going to use that as a segue to ask a personal question. It's a little bit of an off-the-wall question, but maybe it's not. And this is for the whole panel. When I uh, was seeing um, our first speaker, Dr. Twenge, today, um, if she was giving that talk at the American Academy of Pediatrics, it would have been awesome. She showed this incredible decrease in teenage pregnancy, smoking, alcohol. There was another one or two. I mean, things that we've been struggling at for 20 years. And basically, I, I almost thought it was causality she was talking about. It was because of smartphones. Less pregnancy, less drugs, less alcohol. That, it, to me, that was a huge mix match. I couldn't make sense of that in my head. It, well, well, did I hear it right? Did those go down right when the cell phone came out? Was there something else that happened? I, I think that that was more in relation to um, the, the concept that I presented from a different perspective about anti-fragile and fragile that that we're we're overprotective with with our children and that that's had some really positive results mm -hmm. that, that you're talking about but there's also been some some negatives because of that right i think the trade-off is, is incredible impact on mental health so there you, go. you don't get something for nothing but maybe the goldilocks can can appear Hope so. Some, somehow. Okay, here's two uh, maybe more straightforward questions about TV. Ooh. Is TV watching as bad as other screen or media for early childhood development? Mm -hmm. And um, any advice for parents on how to cut down on screen time for their children? Open. Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can perhaps say something. One of the things I did not include in my presentation was the way that television studios uh, um, are designing programs, particularly these series. I mean, I, I'm not, you don't raise your hand, but does anybody here binge watch television series? You know, wait till they come out? Uh, okay. So, uh, just so, so one of the behavioral measures that, uh, I mean, that, that may not cause you a problem uh, to watch, uh, you know, uh, 20 hours of um, whatever, whatever. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but one of the things that, that the producers now know is that they design, this is the, a form of gamification and stuff, they create into those 30 minute segments a cliffhanger right at the end of the, the program to make you, excite you, get that dopamine flowing to find out what happens next. And then what do you do? You move on to the next, uh, you know, the next mm -hmm. thing. So they actually, Netflix can track this and track their behavior. They actually know how to design cliffhangers that work. They actually have programs for, they have uh, measures for television programs and know which ones will get you hooked in one or two, uh, one or two programs. Um, one of the tricks to not get caught in that is to stop before you get to the cliffhanger. I mean, as hard as that may be, so, is stop before you get to the end of the, in the last five minutes and stuff and say, okay, I need to go do something else, and then come back to watch the cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll enjoy the next uh, program even that much better. So, almost sounds like you're talking about a drug user there. This yeah. is right. Yeah. Elizabeth, there's a question for you. Elizabeth Gibbon. Um, how are our local police officers trained to handle youth who may be having a mental health crisis? So, I mean, obviously, it depends a little bit on what the crisis is about, but um, we are dispatched. I remember on patrol, I was dispatched to several different mental health crises. So we've 
received a lot of training that's state mandated. So the state mandates that we do a certain amount of training per year. However, each individual police department can sometimes exceed that. So I know that the Santa Cruz Police Department makes a point to exceed it every year. Um, our minimum mental health standards, uh, we're supposed to do extra training, and we do with other agencies, other uh, county programs. I mean, we try to make partnerships with the Office of Education to try to figure out, like, how is the best way to address issues that are particular in our community. Um, I mean, we do respond to people who are having mental health crises and involve suicidal ideation, threats to other people. Sometimes it's a dual diagnosis issue where we have narcotics involved with a mental health um, diagnosis. So, I mean, basically each officer is, is given this fundamental understanding and they have to combine that with their own training and experience. So it's kind of a hard balance. And that's when we really enjoy like the assistance that the Santa Cruz uh, County mental health liaisons are able to help us with too because they have, obviously that's their primary job is to be social workers in this sort of field. So we do rely on our resources quite a bit for things like that. But um, on a personal level, I remember having to step back from some of these situations and say, okay, am I escalating the issue? Is my appearance in uniform, the presence of a weapon, is this elevating it? I mean, how can I deal with this? And there are times where you have to kind of adapt and say, okay, well, can I get a detective, a plainclothes officer to come help me with this? Is there um, something that this child in crisis needs to help them calm down? Is there uh, particular triggers that I need to avoid? Are there um, like areas where they're gonna feel more comfortable if we're outside and not in a confined space? So you're trying to find ways to, to do your job without making things worse. Um, so I, I encountered that every, like almost every day in patrol, not just with youth, but with people in general. I, I don't know how many of you are completely comfortable when a police officer stops to talk to you, even if they're trying to say it's a nice day out, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I think just inherently any contact with law enforcement creates a level of anxiety. And just the fact that we need to learn how to acknowledge that and find a way to work with that. And I think that we, we are learning and we are trying to do better. Um, so Beautiful. I, know, I hope that answered it. <laughs> and thank you so much can for I, being on this something? panel. Oh my God, that's great. <laughs> can I add something yes, Erica. to that? Um, one of the partnerships that we have in Watsonville is with our local Watsonville Police Department. Um, and I, I wanna uh, just share a little bit about what they're doing um, from a law enforcement uh, end. Uh, they do have an officer who has been trained uh, who has an actually a, a mental health counselor from the Santa Cruz Behavioral Health uh, uh, Agency um, who goes out on beats with the police officer. Uh, many times when they do respond to these calls, if they determine that uh, a service uh, from our agency would be appropriate, oftentimes it's not unexpected for them to walk that person over to our agency, which is really nice because it's a warm handoff, right? Makes it less scary and more likely that that person might engage in our services. So just want to give kudos to the Watsonville Police Department for being so proactive in that way. And then also for the children and the youth in our community specifically, I want to give them credit for thinking many years ago to working upstream um, to not just prevent recidivism but address the multifaceted needs of the children they come in, into contact with. So uh, five years ago, the Watsonville Police Department developed a program called Pathways to Success or Camino Sacia el Éxito. The outcome uh, or the intended goal was to reduce recidivism rates uh, among the youth of Watsonville. But what has happened or has happened over the five year span is that there is, uh, they have embedded case managers in the Watsonville Police Department. When a officer um, comes into contact with a youth that is committing an offense, as long as it's a nonviolent offense, they do get, a, uh, they, they get screened for the possibility of entering this program. We are the mental health providers and case managers for the youth referred to that program. Over 500 youth have been referred and served through this program. 89% of them have not recidivated one year post-graduation of the program. And 30% um, of those youth were in need of mental health or other interventions, uh, intensive interventions. So again, there, I, I think uh, the Watsonville Police Department is a model agency that has figured out a way to utilize general fund uh, and utilize some of the limited capital that they have to embed programs and then to stick with them. 
right? Because that's always a challenge for agencies that may be revenue strapped, but they, make, they have made that a priority, and I love it that all the officers that come in to work for the Watsonville Police Department, they all get trained on this program. It's, one, it's part of the uh, onboarding process that they do. One more example of why it's so amazing in Santa Cruz County. I mean, we're, we're, we're so lucky to have the, the resources that we do. Here's a question for, for Cassie. And Cassie, do you have ideas for how schools could help all students to feel less anxious? And are there school-wide guidelines that could help? Yeah, so I can really speak for what I, um, what works best for me and um, just Growing up in the age of anxiety, I have a lot of people gravitate towards me um, to find out kind of what works for them, too. So I have a lot of sorority sisters that have needed my help, too. So I have a pretty extensive background of different people and what works for them. But I think physical activity and getting outside is huge. So for me, the second I feel anxiety coming on, I have to step outside. I either walk, I do jumping jacks. If I'm on the verge of a panic attack, I will go to a bathroom stall and do jumping jacks and the panic attack will start to go down. Uh, that's the first thing I say to anyone is physical activity and get outside. So I think that if schools could promote a little bit more of that, I know back when I was a kid, Nickelodeon, of all things, used to have a commercial that said, like, verb, it's what you do. And kids used to go outside. It was promoting kids to go outside right when video games were becoming a big thing. Um, so I think just maybe taking, like, a small break during your lesson and taking the kids outside to go over what you're going to talk about, like, if that's possible at all, or um, trying to do more sort of field trips or just kind of breaking up the day um, and making things a little bit more outdoor focused because if you think about it, right, like we used to all be people who lived outside. We foraged, we hunted and everything like that. We were all outside. Now we're indoors. Some people don't see the light of day for an entire day. Of course, our bodies don't know how to react to it. Um, and of course, our minds are going crazy looking at these devices and a million other things. So I think exercise is huge. I also think if there was, um, I heard recently one of my coworkers' sons goes to a school, which sounds like it has a really great program of these kids are allowed to choose one sort of core class instead of like a free period or a study period. They get to go through and choose different things. And the examples that she gave me was there's like yoga, there's a meditation class, there's cooking, there's all these things that are much more hands-on and physical, um, and then mental health awareness kind of driving as well, instead of just saying, like, you have an hour to work on your homework in this building. So I think wow. physicality is huge. Right. Very creative solutions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here, since none of you, I think, write prescriptions, you all have equal access to this question. <laughs> what is the role of psychopharmacology in severe anxiety? Part two is, if SSRIs were released now, would they be called anti-anxiety instead of antidepressants? Mm -hmm. Can I say on? Just, I'm going to try to answer that indirectly and also reflect on something that Cassie said. I mean, we, we, we talk about anxiety as if it's a disease. You know, it's a problem to be avoided. Anxiety is a natural, healthy response to things that aren't working, you know, in our life. Um, it gets out of control when we panic or we don't have the tools necessary to deal with it. Um, I have, as a psychologist, sometimes I have a, a bias against psychotropics because I think what we do is we, we reduce anxiety artificially without necessarily addressing the causes of them and the, the root cause. So I think we have to, as Cassie said, you know, as, as a species, we were not designed, our, our children were not designed to sit in classrooms six or seven hours a day. You know, they were designed to be outside, running around, doing things, and being active. <laughs> So in, when, I think when we're being working with people with anxiety, it's absolutely essential to, to validate their experience of being anxious, you know, to discover, you know, and that's the, part of the detective work, where the anxiety is coming from, and recognize that sometimes the misuse of social media and devices is a, is a, a young person's attempt to deal with their anxiety, um, and we may need to provide them with other the tools. In some instances, as Cassie is saying, it is an extremely helpful, useful tool. We just have to be able to teach them and ourselves how to use these things appropriately. So, so anxiety is not a disease. Okay? I mean, we, we oftentimes treat it as if it is. It's a warning sign that something's not right, and we need to help our clients to develop st more effective strategies to deal with it. Yeah. I'll take that to a, one, one step further. What would you think about this? I would say ADHD is not a disease. Attention is a symptom. 
There's a million reasons not to pay attention. There's just some people where their wiring makes it harder, and then we put them in an environment where it's about impossible to pay attention anyway, and then so it causes a disease, and then it has a medication. And so it's sort of, I mean, these are sort of medical existential questions kind of, kind of things, but you live in the world that you do, and you try to adjust it. Any other comments on um, uh, psychopharmacology for any of these children? I can weigh in on that. Um, well. I was thinking more how I see uh, psychotropics used on, on the college campus, and and certainly sometimes if there there's an extreme uh, panic situation or or trauma, using uh, a benzodiazepine is indicated for a very very short term. Uh, we certainly don't try to get into using those as, as a regular way to, to address anxiety because they're, they're so addictive in themselves. Um, to the other point, I mean, I certainly have seen uh, SSRIs used to target anxiety specifically as opposed to depression, and that's because, you know, aside from, from the benzos, there, there's not a lot of great medication alternatives uh, to address anxiety. I also have a, a bias, though, to uh, to work on on psychotherapy, and we have to we have to experience the anxiety and have exposure to it in order to learn how to deal with it and and reduce it. So sometimes just pulling the symptom away it, in the long run doesn't really get people where they need to be. Right. Okay. Um, Commenter? Yes, Cassie. So I've been on all the different things, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, they essentially tranquilize you, um, benzos especially. I have found, I've been to probably 20 different psychiatrists, psychologists over my life, and um, I've been to a few that opt to, I get there, they weigh me, they ask me about what medications I'm on, and they give me four more. Um, I've been to others where we go through and we do like EMDR or we do um, breathing exercises. I love those ones. I had an amazing homeopathic um, psychiatrist when I went to Sonoma State and um, she really, really helped me kind of realize like, okay, because at the time when I went to her, I was taking two Ativan a day. Someone had prescribed to me that. So in the morning I had an Ativan, in the evening I had an Ativan. I was also on 40 milligrams of Lexapro a day. If I were to watch Marley and me, I would not cry kind of a thing. Like, I had no, nothing. And I'm a dog person. <laughs> so, essentially tranquilized, right? And I agree with what you're saying. You have to be able to feel the anxiety. So, she was able to wean me off of all of that. We used a bunch of different things, breathing. I took tryptophan, the stuff that's in Turkey, um, to help me wean myself off of it. But I think the most powerful thing for me as far as coping with my anxiety is learning to not fear it and sit through a panic attack. Um, if I can't sit through a panic attack and realize this is going to end in six to seven minutes, um, I'm never going to be able to cope through the anxiety because it almost brings on agoraphobic tendencies if I completely avoid it. So let's say I have a panic attack in a car with someone. Um, I don't ever want to go in a car with someone again. If I live the rest of my life never going in a car with someone again, I will never get over that fear. So for me, I think it's very important for me to then get in a car with someone and drive for a minute the next day, maybe two minutes the day after that, and not just go to a psychiatrist and have them prescribe me an Ativan or a Xanax. So it, totally, I agree with what you're saying. Feel the anxiety, live through it. That's the only way you can get better. Wow. Totally well said. I'll try to uh, read this uh, carefully. I, I think, Paul, this was generated by a little part of your slide, but anybody can uh, comment. Here it is. Sexual positivity is important in the process of development. I agree that Pornhub does portray sex in a negative, false way, and it fetishizes gay-lesbian relationships. However, masturbation is important for sexual self-discovery and shouldn't be negativized. Do you hold the opinion that masturbation and sexual exposure is bad in adolescence? And uh, could you expand on why those, expand on that topic? Okay, well, this is my fear. If I used it, talked about masturbation, Hagen does ice cream, is that you would all associate me with that going forward. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> masturbation is a normal sexual practice. Uh, I mean, everybody does it, uh, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, everyone should. Um, 
it, and among young people and stuff, it, it's normal as well. I think those of us who work with young people have to be comfortable talking about subjects like that, about sexuality, um, because oftentimes it's not occurring at home. Um, it may be occurring over Instagram or other places and stuff, but oftentimes in inappropriate and infantile type, types of ways. Um, in, in talking about television and, and social media and whatnot, I think one of the most important roles that parents should have is to participate in these activities with their children, to help educate them, teach them to think critically about what they're, what they're watching. I mean, I'm not advocating necessarily parents watching pornography with their children, but, um, but educating them about what's real and, and what's not, so that they develop healthy attitudes about sex, about their bodies, about relationships. And I really think this is a critical role for us. I'm, I'm actually... I mean, terrified might be a, the, the, not the right word, but the, uh, the fact that our children are being educated by these pornographic sites. Okay? And if you don't think that they're not watching it, you're totally, you know, you're living on another planet and stuff. Huh? Um, and I'm hearing from the kids that I work with that they're oftentimes acting out some of the things that they're watching because they think that that is real, that that's what sex and intimacy is supposed to be all about. Mm -hmm. So... And if you have questions about ice cream, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, two, two other commentaries. Valerie. Um, so the California Healthy Youth Act that came in at, in 2016 really changed a lot of things about sex education in schools. And we do it in our seventh grade. There's also a ninth grade component. But the California Healthy Youth Act really outlined things that had previously not been covered positively, affirmatively, health in a healthy way in sex ed previously. If you remember your health ed um, learning in your own school, I mean, for some of us, it was abominable. But just in having um, really healthy discussions around body image, around consent, around masturbation, around LGBTQ affirming issues, um, again, um, and I, I love that that's happening, but it's a program. It's codified into our curriculum. And I think that as we learn more and get better at these things, educators have this unique um, opportunity. And I think, I think it was Paul who said he was happy to have a captive audience again. But education is you have the opportunity and the responsibility to be presenting students with representations of themselves that are healthy um, for everyone in that room. And so we are slowly getting there with new programs and protocols, but um, I really like the new sex ed programs that we have, and I hope we continue to learn in that way. Yeah, good. Erica, while we still have time, I want, you're doing some particular work on prevention with very young children, under five population, uh, in, in terms of uh, trying to develop resilience and coping with adverse childhood events? Yes, uh, we have um, a, a few specialized clinicians who um, for over five years have been working in tandem with an initiative in the Monterey County uh, Behavioral Health System of Care, um, primarily uh, to address the emotional needs of, of uh, parents, caregivers, and their, um, their, their babies, their zero to five babies, babies within that age group. And um, for, for over five years, the Monterey County First Five uh, uh, group has been really identifying training opportunities to, um, to clinicians who are interested in working with this, this young population and their families. And uh, we've been partnering um, with First Five Monterey County uh, for many years now. Uh, we've used the ACEs uh, in, in our assessment uh, uh, process. Um, we're expanding it, trying to expand it into Santa Cruz County, and we've partnered up with Salud Para La Gente, mm -hmm. a federally qualified health center in Watsonville, uh, to try to see if we can um, be of support to uh, the children that seek uh, medical care uh, through their clinics. Uh, we call that program Moving Healthcare Upstream uh, because we understand the impact and the long-term um, positive effects that uh, children and their families can have when we interfere at an early age. Uh, we're really excited about uh, our, our effort to expand care for the youngest in our community uh, because as we've all read and, and continue to read and we have Dr. Burke now at the state who's pushing the ACEs, we all understand 
right, uh, what that means in the long term. It's also, from a fiscal perspective, total WISE investment, right? Not just in the overall health and uh, maximizing opportunity for that child, but let's face it, we have a lot of work to do to shift our system so that we are preventing, right, the things that then we're spending so much money addressing as they grow up and become adults. So, uh, yes, we're very, very happy to be working in this effort. Great. Yeah, thank you. Gary. And I, I, I'm thrilled to hear that, that you're doing that work. And there are countries in, in Scandinavia where they're, uh, they're teaching emotional intelligence to second graders. And that's what we need to do. Because I'll tell you, college is too late. <laughs> so, you know, we're just playing catch up and we're never going to get there. And the, the time for, for people to learn about how to, how to regulate their emotions is, uh, is in primary school. And, and this needs to be built into our curriculum in a very fundamental way. And if we don't do it, it there's going to be significant consequences. So mm -hmm. please go do that. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dunn, but one more brief commentary. This is just slightly off topic, but of uh, quite a bit of interest, the, the uh, uh, graduate student strike up at UC. Do you think that there are mental health issues associated with the rent burden and financial impact uh, for students? There is some interest in this. I look at it as a, as a hierarchy of needs issue, uh, that if you're struggling with uh, with basic security of, of food and housing, you're not even at a point where, where you can be thinking about your, your mental health. You're thinking about your survival. So, um, so I, for, for many of our graduate students, that is the case. Now, we'll, we'll, does, does it have an impact on one's mental health if, if you're worried about these things? A absolutely. Um, and you know, as does, uh, it, frankly, it's causing a, a myriad of mental health reverberations throughout campus. Yeah. Uh, you know, students who are feeling, undergraduate students who are feeling conflicted, they, they support the graduate students, but they're also trying to complete their education and, and what, do, what do they do? Uh, graduate students who maybe support the, the movement, but are, are involved in research protocols where they really can't step away, uh, otherwise they'll lose their funding. So, so there are, are many, it, it's a multi-layered wow. issue. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for commenting. Okay, I think we're coming close to the end of time. And here's a little bit of a general question. Is the amount of uncertainty, stress, and anxiety in society greater than in the past, greater than ever, or, or, or not? And um, what are the factors? Partly related to that is um, in the current political landscape with the uh, breakdown of protection for immigrants, minority groups, and building a border wall. Uh, what about the levels of anxiety related to those issues? And I am surprised that nobody has mentioned anxiety associated with the climate crisis. Yeah. So, what do you think about these political issues and global anxiety? I guess beyond technology and cell phones. Let me let me touch a little bit on on the topic of immigration because I know I referenced it in my my introduction. Um, when we had a change in leadership at the federal level, um, the following days, <laughs> leadership, um, the following few days after that, the attendance at our local schools dropped, and I'm sure that probably happened in many schools throughout the county. Um, the superintendent and I uh, uh, had a discussion about, okay, what can we do? What can we do? Because this seems to be a, a impacting uh, many of the families and the children in, in our school system. And so we said, oh, why don't we, why don't we organize a community forum so that we can um, have parents show up, we'll offer childcare, and we, we can have an open discussion to alleviate some of this anxiety, because we recognized that it was anxiety, right? And we really thought it was gonna be on a Sunday, right? Because we know that's when a lot of the families um, are off of work or have time. 
And we expected 50 families, right? How many families, Erica, do you think will come, she asked. I said, yeah, about 50, right? It's a Sunday, uh, about 50. We had 500. And uh, let's just say this. We were both looking at each other like, oh, boy. <laughs> but we, I share that because it told us the communal anxiety that was existing with the many families and students that attend the local schools. And that te uh, set up a need for us to uh, develop a system within the community of Watsonville to address the multifaceted issues that have since uh, resulted due to this topic being a focal point of discussion at the policy level. Um, I hate to uh, say that things have gotten better. I think to some degree there's a little bit of uh, uh, desensitizing that's been happening. Um, uh, but the truth is the issues have gotten deeper. The, the amount of anxiety that um, we see, not just with the children we serve, but the caretakers. Uh, is, it, it, our clinicians are constantly having conversations with each other about the manifestation of what they are seeing. So it's almost like we're learning together. Um, but I do want to make that a point, because I know that in North County, we also have a very uh, 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 strong immigrant community who is in need of support. And I can tell you we did have raids in our community, and I can tell you that there were caretakers and parents who were um, removed from the home. And I can tell you that the aftermath of that is um, things that our clinicians can, frankly, what did they call it the other day? I feel like we're just patching up things all the time, but we can't really get to the root of it because this is a problem that we're somewhat not able to solve right at the moment. We do have an opportunity coming up uh, to do that. Uh, but but I, I, I want to highlight that because we are a diverse county and we do have immigrants uh, who contribute greatly to the beautiful fabric that we are as a county. And this is a top, topic that I want to encourage all of us to elevate because it is happening to our families. It is present in their anxiety. It is present in the discourse that they're having in their homes. I just think we have a lot of room for improving the way we're responding to that. And I'm gonna, if uh, I could just touch on that really quick, oh, I mean, Thanks that is a good. huge problem that we have had in law enforcement. Or people are victimized, serious victims of horrendous, horrendous crimes, and they're afraid to report because of the immigration issue. Um, I've had to reassure victims of sexual assaults or domestic violence that I don't need to know your immigration status. These are not things that I need to know as part of my investigation, so I'm not going to ask them. And then we've, I mean, we've had to dissolve partnerships that we previously held with other organizations because of, you know, because of the sensitive topic. I mean, that we are, we are minimizing a lot of our federal involvement in our own office over the past few years because of this sort of issue. We want to be able to serve the community that, that we're trying to protect. And if they don't feel that they're actually going to protect, be protected, we had to look to that relationship. So... I can see how that would be a very valid fear and a cause for great anxiety in our community. Uh, I think that the fact that we're able to talk about it, though, shows a lot because it's very difficult in the past for people to talk about mental health, about anxiety, about depression, about bullying, about any of these topics. Previously, it was much more difficult to talk about it because people don't want to admit that they have some sort of um, problem, right? I mean... I, as an officer, struggle with PTSD sometimes or anxiety or depression just from the content of my work. Previously, we would never talk about that sort of thing. So I do think that I don't know if there's been more anxiety in the world, but it may be that it's easier to talk about. I'm going to close with one last very heartfelt question. There are so many of you that are in the schools and I think all of us can think of this. I teach five to seven-year-olds in public schools. I've seen an increase in anxiety, perfectionism in young kids. Can you give me tips for working with these kids and also tips for me to tell parents on how to support their kids? I'll leave that open. Or Valerie, looks like you're ready to comment. Well, that makes my palms sweat. 
Um, yes, I, I think that we have to explicitly teach our kids how to fail, how to fail well. And it's a little bit in response to the comment about being anti-fragile. Um, and this is a parenting trend, it's a, it's a societal trend, and, and the presenters today kind of touched on it in a variety of different ways, but our kids are mortified to fail, to not achieve, to not get ahead, to not have. And if, we, if I could say one thing as an educator and as a parent, it's to teach kids how to fail and recover and fail and recover and build that resilience that they're gonna need in everything. Okay, let's give it up for this panel, amazing.